Well, good morning. And welcome to Grace Valley's Adult Sunday School. And in John chapter 6, we read our, Christ's, our, our Lord Christ saying, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Oh, Lord God, this metaphor is truly one that we cannot even begin to plumb the depths of. And Lord, it speaks of our union with Christ. And we praise you and we thank you because it is only in Christ that there is salvation. It is only in Christ that there is eternal life. Outside of Christ, there is nothing but death and destruction and eternal damnation. And so, Lord, I pray that as we consider this doctrine this morning, this mother of all doctrines, O oh God, union with Christ, that you would build us up in our most holy faith, O oh God. Lord, help each one of us, Lord, to love you more. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think we are in our penultimate session here. But uh, hopefully by the end, you'll have this memorized. So here's Murray's order of application of the events in redemption again. An effectual calling is where God calls us into fellowship with his son. Regeneration or new birth is when God enables us to respond to that call by giving us a new heart. Faith and repentance are the two sides of our response to that call based on our new birth. Justification is then God's legal declaration based on our having expressed faith and repentance that we are just or righteous and it's grounded on the righteousness of Christ imputed to us by faith. And then adoption is God's legal act to make us members of his family. And sanctification is God's working in us to transform us to be more like Jesus Christ where we will in fact have a righteousness of our own. Not as the ground of our salvation but as the result. And then last week we looked at perseverance, that those who are truly born again will in fact persevere to the end. And today we're going to discuss union with Christ, where believers are united to Christ by faith. And Murray explains why union with Christ is not just a step in this order of salvation or ordo salutis. He writes, union with Christ is in itself a very broad and embraceive subject. It is not simply a step in the application of redemption when viewed according to the teaching of Scripture in its broadest aspects it underlies every step of the application of redemption. Union with Christ is really the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation not only in its application but also in its once for all accomplishment in the finished work of Christ. And so early on in the book, you may remember, he spoke about the fact that union with Christ could have been placed in different places because it isn't really just a step. As he says here, it's sort of the foundation, the, the thing that undergirds all of the steps in the application of redemption. And it's interesting, Puritan theologians talked about a believer's threefold union with Christ, which I found to be useful. And they talk about the imminent union. Notice that there's an A there, not an I. It doesn't mean something that's about to happen. It means something that is inherent in God. So it is somehow inherent in God to have thought of us as being in Christ because he chose us in Christ from before the foundation of the world. So there is a sense in which it's proper to say we have been in Christ for all eternity. But then there's also what the, what the Puritans called the transient union, and that refers to our being united to Christ in his life, death, and resurrection. So he was our federal head, he was our representative, and so as our representative, everything he did, in a sense, we were united to him in those actions. Everything he did in his complete obedience in his life and his giving himself up as a sacrifice for the atonement for sins and in his being raised from the dead. And then finally, there's what they called the applicatory union, which refers to our experience of union with Christ in our own life. So the ultimate expression of this union, or the ultimate sense in which we're, union, we're in united with Christ, doesn't occur until in time and space 
God causes us to be born again and to respond in faith and repentance, and it's at that moment that we are truly, in the complete sense, united to Christ. And it's instructive to examine what the Puritans said, and I thought it was well summed up by Beakey and Jones in their book, uh, A Puritan Theology, and they wrote the following, Christ establishes a union with the elect sinner by apprehending him and then giving the spirit to him. But this union is only complete, ultimate union, when the sinner exercises faith in Christ. This basic pattern is confirmed later in Goodwin's work on justifying faith, and they then quote from Thomas Goodwin, it is true indeed the union on Christ's part is in order of nature first made by the spirit. Therefore, Philippians 3.12, he is said first to comprehend us ere we can comprehend him. That's quoting the King James, of course, and we'll see the NIV in a moment. Yet that which makes the union on our part is faith, whereby we embrace and cleave to him. It is faith alone that doth it. Love indeed makes us cleave to him also, but yet faith first. And so Goodwin was quoting there a part of Philippians 3.12, which in the NIV reads, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So we see this two, two aspects of this union with Christ. He takes hold of us, and we must take hold of him. And Beaky and, June, Beaky and Jones note the following, before the new believer is aware, our, your, our Lord unites us to himself, takes hold of us, and works in us. The Spirit then regenerates the sinner, who in turn exercises faith toward Christ and completes the union. From that union flow all other spiritual blessings. And so we see, indeed, Christ takes hold of us first, and of course that's primary and of first importance and guarantees that we will take hold of him, as we've been speaking about many times in this course. But nonetheless, we must take hold of Christ. There's a, there's a mutualness to this union. And it made me think of the picture of a handshake. And this is obviously, a handshake is obviously a very, very low analogy for union with Christ, which is infinitely higher. And yet, in some ways, it's a good analogy because who is shaking hands with whom? They're shaking hands with each other. It's not just that one person reaches out and grabs the other and yanks on them. They're shaking hands. So... They both have to be involved in this process. And obviously Christ must be in us. We are united by regeneration, and that comes first and guarantees what follows. But nonetheless, we must be in Christ, which is consummated in a sense by our faith in Jesus Christ. And there's perhaps one other way in which this analogy is a little bit useful. If you're falling to your death and I reach out and lay a hold of you and we've both got a grip on each other, whose grip matters the most? The strongest one. <laughs> if we're holding on to each other. Well, if I'm holding on to Christ and Christ is holding on to me, guess what? <laughs> Christ's grip is infinitely stronger. If my salvation depends on me being able to hold on to Christ to the very end, I'm done. But I know that it doesn't depend solely on me. It depends on Jesus Christ. And we read in, in John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. If you have grasped Jesus Christ and he has laid hold of you, there is nothing that can tear you out of that grasp. And that's a great comfort for us as Christians. John Calvin in his Institutes of the Christian Religion wrote the following, so long as we are without Christ and separated from him, nothing which he suffered and did for the salvation of the human race is of the least benefit to us. We should stop there and think. Everyone has been outside of Christ, and the majority of people alive today still are outside of Christ. And independent of many protestations to the contrary, that all people are saved by Christ even if they don't know it, which is a common view now, it's simply not true. If you are outside of Christ, nothing that he did to gain salvation for his people is of any benefit to you at all. And John Calvin goes on, to communicate to us the blessings which he received from the Father, he must become ours and dwell in us. Accordingly, he is called our head and the firstborn among many brethren. 
Well, on the other hand, we are said to be engrafted into him and clothed with him, all which he possesses being, as I have said, nothing to us until we become one with him. The whole comes to this, that the Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ effectually binds us to himself. Now, if you hadn't read the scriptures very much, you might think John Calvin had gone too far here when he says, we become one with him. That almost sounds like I'm going to become part of deity or something, which of course is untrue, as we'll see later. But he's not going too far, because it's what scripture itself says. It's an amazing thing. Paul wrote the following in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And we want to understand that verse and others that are like it in the New Testament. What on earth does the apostle mean? I mean, look at that verse and think about it for a minute. I've been crucified with Christ. How can Paul say he's been crucified with Christ? And he says, I no longer live. Well, he was writing this. He clearly was alive. How can he say, I no longer live? And then he says, but Christ lives in me. And then the life I live in the body, so there's somehow something more than that, but the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. It's an amazing statement, and we want to try and get some tiny understanding of this astounding doctrine of union with Christ. And Paul uses the expressions in Christ or in him or in Christ Jesus. If you go look in a concordance in the NIV version, he uses those 112 times in his letters. If you ascribe Hebrews to Paul, you get, I think, three more. Maybe it's one or two more, but anyway. And of course, there are other expressions that are similar because in this we see uh, that I have been crucified with Christ and Christ lives in me and so forth. So those aren't the only expressions, but those are used 112 times. This is obviously an incredibly important pervasive doctrine within the New Testament, this idea of being in Christ. And we want to understand what it means. John Murray called union with Christ the mother of all doctrines. He doesn't say that in Redemption Accomplished and Applied, and I couldn't find it in his other collected writings either to quote a, a verse for you or a page for you, but we have it on good authority, namely our pastor who was one of his students, that this is what John Murray called the doctrine. And it's an appropriate thing to call it. Why? Because all doctrines are traceable back to it. Without God's having chosen a people for himself in Christ, from all eternity, there would be, there wouldn't be any Christian faith. There would be no Christianity. So in that sense, it certainly is the mother of all doctrines. All other doctrines are birthed out of it, in a sense. The Puritan Thomas Goodwin put it a different way, and he said that being in Christ and united to him is the fundamental constitution of a Christian. It is what it means to be a Christian at the end of the day, to be in Christ. And what does the Bible say? I've put up a number of verses here. This is not by any stretch of the imagination all of the things I could have put up, nor is it all of the verses I could have put up. But I wanted to show how pervasive this idea is in the New Testament. And many of the terms used here are overlapping and somewhat synonymous and so forth. But let's just take a quick survey. And you can go home and look up the verses. We are united to Christ in our election. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4, and 2 Timothy 1, 9. We are united in rebirth. Ephesians 2, 5 and 10. We're united in justification, Romans 8, 1 and Galatians 2, 17. We're united in redemption, 1 Corinthians 1, 30, Ephesians 1, 7 and Colossians 1, 14. We're united in eternal life, 1 John 5, 11 and 2 Timothy 1, 1. We're united in salvation, 2 Timothy 2, 10. We're united in grace, 2 Timothy 2, 1. We're united in faith and love, 1 Timothy 1.14 and 2 Timothy 1.13. We're united in wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2.3. We're united with the seal of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1.13. We're united in holiness in 1 Corinthians 1.30. We're united in righteousness in 1 Corinthians 1.30 and 2 Corinthians 5.21 and Philippians 3.9. We're united in perseverance in Philippians 4.1 and 1 Thessalonians 3.8. We're united in death in Romans 6.5 and Revelation 14.13. We're united in resurrection in Romans 6.5 and 1 Corinthians 15.21-23 and Ephesians 2.6 and 1 Thessalonians 4.14 and 16. 
We're united in session. We are seated with Christ in Ephesians 2, 6. And we're united in glory in Philippians 4, 19, especially if you look in the ESV. So this is an amazingly pervasive doctrine that just is, permeates the entire New Testament. Murray summarizes it well. He says, what is it that binds past and present and future together in the life of faith and in the hope of glory? Why does the believer entertain the thought of God's determinate counsel with such joy? Why can he have patience in the perplexities and adversities of the present? Why can he have confident assurance with reference to the future and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God? It is because he cannot think of past, present, or future apart from union with Christ. That's an amazing thing to think about. And in fact, you know, again, if you were born again as an adult as I was, I was 38 years old when I was born again, and I can look back on my life prior to the time I was born again when I was a rebel. I hated God. I was running from God. I wanted nothing to do with him. But I can see the times when he clearly rescued me from destroying my own life. He had a plan for me. I was already in his mind. I was not yet united to Christ in one sense, but in another sense I was because I was in Christ from before the creation. And he preserved me. He didn't allow me to destroy my life because he had a plan. Amazing. Hallelujah. Praise God. What an amazing thing this is to think about. And you can't think about the present outside of Christ, and you can't think about the future outside of Christ. Why is it a Christian can ask confidence? Because we're not going to have any trouble? Because Joel Osteen is right, and that if I have enough faith, I'm going to be rich and happy and healthy all my life? Well, that's nonsense. Christ himself says, I'll have trouble. But he also says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. My grace is sufficient for you. And we can rejoice even in troubles and trials because we are united to Jesus Christ. Our ultimate hope is bound up in Christ. It is our death and or his second coming, whichever happens first, that will bring our union to its ultimate expression. We read in 1 Thessalonians 4, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Our ultimate, as we're going to talk about next week, glorification, and that doesn't just refer to our dying and being made perfect in our spirit. That's not the ultimate goal of Christianity. That's not the ultimate hope. The ultimate hope is that I will receive a resurrection body like unto his glorious body, and I will spend eternity in heaven with him. So it's just a mind-boggling thought. It should stagger us to think about something like that. And that's what our hope is. And that's when our union with Christ will come to its ultimate expression. In one sense, we were in Christ, as we've said, from all eternity. But we became actual partakers, is what Murray says, of Christ when we first believed. So we have to take account of the scriptures, like Ephesians 2.12, that says at that time, so before you were born again, you were separate, separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. And in Ephesians 2, 3, we're told that like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Now, how can these be true simultaneously? Well, again, a very poor analogy, but the best one I could come up with. Think about a couple that has decided to get married. Let's assume they're both honorable and decent and trustworthy people. They've decided to get married. They've committed to be married. So they're going to be married, so long as they don't die first or something. Prevents it. But they aren't married yet, are they? Legally, they're still two separate individuals. So, yes, they have decided to marry. There's a commitment to marry. All of that's there, but they haven't actually done it yet. Well, in the same way, God has determined who he's going to save. And in his mind, we are already united to Christ in that sense, chosen from before the creation of the world. It's going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. There was a time when we were outside of Christ. We were objects of wrath. So Murray examines the nature of our union with Christ under two headings. He says it is a spiritual union and it is a mystical union. And both of those things need to be defined and, and carefully brought out or they can be misinterpreted. So he notes the following, few words in the New Testament have been subjected to more distortion than the word spiritual. 
Frequently it is used to denote what is little more than vague sentimentality. Spiritual in the New Testament refers to that which is of the Holy Spirit. Hence, when we say that union with Christ is spiritual, we mean, first of all, that the bond of this union is the Holy Spirit himself. Second, it is a spiritual relationship that is in view. I'm quite sure that every single one of you has come across somebody in your life who says, oh, I'm, no, I'm not a Christian, I don't believe that, but I'm a very spiritual person. They don't mean the same thing <laughs> that the Holy Spirit means, when it, that, that the Bible means when it talks about being spiritual. The Bible is talking about being united to Christ through the Holy Spirit, having the Holy Spirit in you, indwelling you, guiding you, and leading you. People, when they say spiritual, they mean all kinds of different things. I don't even know half the time what it is they mean because they say things that make no sense. But the world's idea of spiritual is not what the New Testament means. We need to get rid of that. And so in Romans 8, 9, we read, You, however, speaking of those who have been born again, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. A pretty clear statement. The Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Christ, and it is the bond that unites us to Christ. If the Holy Spirit is not in you, you're not in Christ. It's as simple as that. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we read, we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. So by the spirit, we are all made part of the body of Christ. This is the corporate aspect or the communal aspect of it we see now. Not only individually are we in Christ, but collectively as a church and collectively together as parts of the members of the body, we are in Christ as the body of Christ, of which he is the head. Murray notes that we cannot define exactly what this union means, uh, but it is unique. And so he points out that even though these things can all be used in some sense and are used in Scripture in some sense as, as examples or analogies, nonetheless, our union with Christ is not exactly like the relationship with, within the Trinity, one God and three persons. Nor is it like the union of God and man in Christ, the two natures in one person. Nor is it like the body and soul united in man. And nor is it just a matter of feeling, affection, understanding, mind, heart, will, and purpose. No, it is something more, which Murray can't find the words to express, and neither can I. But it's, it's a unique relationship that is what the Bible means by this union with Christ. And by saying that our union with Christ is a mystical union, Murray means that it is a mystery that has been revealed to us. That's all he means by mystical. You can look at Romans 16, 25 and 26. It was kept secret from eternity, but it has now been made known, and it has been revealed in the Scripture. And the goal of this revelation is that the whole body of Christ, the whole church, should come to the obedience of faith and thereby glorify God and be brought into his presence. Paul clearly tells us that this union is mystical. He writes, I have become its, speaking of the churches, servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So there it is. It's mystical. This idea of Christ in you. Union with Christ. He in you, you in him. It's a mystery, but it's been revealed to us by God through the Bible. Praise God. And even though we can't fully understand it or fathom it, nonetheless, we can enjoy it and we can rejoice in it and we can try to learn more about it. And the Bible gives us a number of different comparisons for the mystical union. So even though it's not exactly like these things, they can be used as comparisons. And the highest one of all, by far, is found in John chapter 17, his high priestly prayer, where he says, my prayer is not for them alone, for those who are with him. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That, that, that passage should absolutely boggle our minds. He says, may they be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. It just, just completely staggers the imagination to try and think of what that means. 
So he is, in a sense, comparing it with the unity that exists within the Godhead. And so this passage does one thing new. It tells us our unity is not just with Christ, but also with the Father. May they be also be in us, Christ says to the Father. But it also there's a warning that we need to make here after that wonderful expression about just as you are in me and I am in you. So Murray points out we must guard against error again here. Union with Christ does not mean that we are incorporated into the life of the Godhead. That is one of the distortions to which this great truth has been subjected. So when we start speaking about spiritual things, we have to be careful because people often relate spiritual with illogical, irrational, contradictory, and they can say all kinds of things. And when you point out that it's a contradiction or it's stupid or it's irrational, well, but it's spiritual. So it's a spiritual truth. It's not subject to rationality and logic. No, (laughs) no, that's just dumb. That's not at all what the Bible means. And so we have to be careful with those sorts of things. God is not saying in his word here that we're going to become God in any way, shape, or form. We're going to be creatures forever, eternally. Nevertheless, this union is an astounding one. Of all the kinds of union or unity that exist for creatures, the union of believers with Christ is the highest, Murray says. I don't know how you could possibly take any exception to that statement. It is the highest. You know, we are creatures. We will eternally be creatures, even in heaven. That distinction is never going to go away. There's God, the creator, and there's creatures. That's it. Those are the only things. But we will spend eternity in his presence with fellow, in fellowship with him. He created us in his image, whatever exactly that means. And we will enjoy that kind of fellowship that we can't even begin to imagine now in this life and we'll enjoy it for eternity it's something well worth sitting and meditating about and giving great praise and thanks to god for we also see the union compared with a vine and its branches in john 15 1 through 8 of course christ is the vine we are the branches if you take a branch away from the vine it doesn't do very well does it the sap isn't getting to it there's no vital life coming to it it just dries up and dies and bears no fruit, and it's useful only for throwing in the flames. Well, that's us outside of Christ. We're also given the comparison of a head and the body in Ephesians chapter 4. Christ is the head, the church is the body of Christ, and we are all parts of that body and have to view ourselves that way. And of course, where the head goes, the body goes. If it doesn't, you've got an abomination. (laughs) A head running around without a body, and a body running around with that head. That doesn't look very good. So then we also see the comparison of Adam and his posterity in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. What is that? Well, Adam was the first federal head, the first representative of humanity, and he failed, completely and utterly failed. And we were in Adam at one time, and in that same way as we were in Adam by birth, by being his descendants by birth, natural generation, so if we are born again, we are in Christ as descendants of God through the Spirit, born again. So again, there's a comparison there. You're in Adam or you're in Christ. And then we also see the comparison of the stones of a building in Ephesians 2 and 1 Peter 2, where of course Christ is the chief cornerstone and we're the living stones that make up the temple of God. And so these are amazing metaphors when we think about them, but they're all talking about this union with Christ and with each other as a part of the body of Christ. Paul compares this union with the most intimate human relationship, marriage. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. And unfortunately, there are people out there who have been very crass in thinking about this verse. It's not just talking about sex. This verse is talking about a much deeper union that should exist between a man and a woman in marriage in that they become united to form one entity d- defined by one purpose, one will, one desire. One, you know, they should be one. It's not just talking about the physical union. And as that's true, so it shall be true that the church is united with Jesus Christ. One purpose, one will, one goal, the glory of God, all working together to accomplish that. What an amazing thought. And Murray explains what he calls an intelligent mysticism as opposed to what most people would think of when they think of that word. He says, it is necessary for us to recognize that there is an intelligent mysticism in the life of faith. Believers are called into the fellowship of Christ, 
and fellowship means communion. The life of faith is one of living union and communion with the exalted and ever-present Redeemer. There is no communion among men that is comparable to fellowship with Christ. The life of faith is the life of love, and the life of love is the life of fellowship, or mystic communion with him who ever lives to make intercession for his people and who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows what it's like to be a man. He has been tempted in every way, just as you and I have been, but he was without sin. Marie notes that the life of true faith cannot be that of cold, metallic assent. It must have the passion and warmth of love and communion because communion with God is the crown and apex of true religion. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, it says in 1 John 1, 3. So think about that, cold, metallic assent. If you say you have union with Christ and all you have is mental assent, it's like saying you've got a loving relationship with something, but it's a metal pole and you're grabbing a hold of it. It's not very warm to, to embrace. We need to have a love. There has to be a warmth there or there's no true faith there. And calling communion with God the crown and apex of true religion goes along with what he said before and repeats here. He uses the same verse twice in this chapter, if you noticed, once on, I think, page one and then once here, page one of the chapter, that is, whatever page that is. He says, union with Christ is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. And he goes on to relate this to adoption. He says, as we found earlier in these studies, it is adoption into the family of God and sons and daughters of the Lord Almighty, as sons and daughters, I'm sorry, of the Lord Almighty, that accords to the people of God the apex of blessing and privilege. But we cannot think of adoption apart from union with Christ. Union with Christ reaches its zenith in adoption, and adoption has its orbit in union with Christ. So he calls union with Christ the apex of religion, and he calls Adoption, the apex of blessing and privilege. But they go together. You can't conceive of being adopted into the family of God without there being union with Christ. We have to be of the same family. We have to be united with him in some very intimate way because we need the righteousness of Christ in order to come into the presence of God. And we need the imputation of his righteousness to us. And it was argued by the Roman church at the time of the Reformation that that was improper. You know, Peter can't save Paul. Paul can't save Peter. How can Christ save you or me? How can it be right for his righteousness to be imputed to us? And the argument made by the reformers in general was because of the union with Christ, that intimate relationship. And because of that intimate relationship and union with Christ, it's legitimate and reasonable for his righteousness to be imputed to us and vice versa for my sins to be imputed to him and him having paid for them. In Romans 8, 15 to 17, we read an amazing passage. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. That's a passage well worth going home and meditating on. And I don't like using exclamation points too often, but they have to be used here. What privilege could you possibly have to be co-heirs with Christ and ultimately to share in his glory? But that is the hope to which we are called. And Murray makes an important application of this doctrine clear when he writes, it is out of the measureless fullness of grace and truth, of wisdom and power, of goodness and love, of righteousness and faithfulness which resides in him that God's people draw for all their needs in this life and for the hope of the life to come. There is no truth, therefore, more suited to impart confidence and strength, comfort and joy in the Lord than this one of union with Christ. Paul said, through through him, I, I can do all things through him who gives me strength, right? I'm weak, he is strong, and my weakness, his strength is made manifest, his grace is sufficient, all of these things which are true and real and build us up and enable us to carry on the Christian life in, in, in the face of all of the difficulties that we have. 
And we read in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. What a promise. And notice the we. It's not just Christ. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. We read in John 17, as we saw earlier, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, as I pointed out earlier, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And so Murray points out that there's another aspect of this union which we've already seen and mentioned. The thought is overwhelming, he says, but it is unmistakable. The Father, as well as Christ, comes and makes his abode with the believer. And not only is it the Father who is united with believers and dwells in them, Jesus tells us likewise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we read in John 14, again, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. This is the bond that unites us to Christ and the Spirit is not just the Spirit of God, it's the Spirit of Christ. And there's the bond for our union with Christ. And Murray continues, it is union therefore with the Father and with the Son and with the Holy Spirit that union with Christ draws along with it. So when the Bible talks about being united to Christ, it's not just talking about Christ as the second person of the Trinity. And in 1 John 1, 3, we read our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And as we saw, we can add the Holy Spirit to that. So Murray concludes, he writes, Here indeed is mysticism on the highest plane. It is not the mysticism of vague, unintelligible feeling or rapture. It is the mysticism of communion with the one true and living God. It is not the blurred confusion of rapturous ecstasy. It is faith solidly founded on the revelation deposited for us in the scripture, and it is faith actively receiving that revelation by the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. But it is also faith that stirs the deepest springs of emotion in the raptures of holy love and joy. Emotion was created by God. Emotion is good. There should be emotion in religion. But if religion is reduced to emotion, if we're all just jumping up and down and raising our hands and shouting and screaming and the songs beating and pounding, you can do that on a rock concert or at a 49ers game. That's not religion. It may make you excited. You may get some endorphins going and feel really good about yourself and good about the world and everything, but that's not religion. Religion is apprehended first and foremost in the mind. And we need to remember that. But it does affect the emotions. They should be there. And what does the Bible say again? Well, we will have that holy love and joy that Murray speaks about if we meditate on the wondrous things that God has done for us and how they are expressed by this doctrine of union with Christ. And just a couple of verses here, Ephesians 2, 6, we read, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. This is a present reality. This isn't talking about when I die. This is about right now I am seated with Christ in heavenly realms in some sense that I can't fully fathom. I'm obviously not physically present there, but I am united to Christ who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the ruler of all. And then in Colossians 3 we read, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. Just like Paul, I've been crucified. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. What an amazing expression. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's our hope. And so what's the application of this? Well, since union with Christ is central to our faith, in order to make our calling and election sure, we must be sure that we are, in fact, united with him. And there are different ways you could express this. You can look for the soul of God, the life of God and the soul of man, as Henry Skugel put it. You can look for true love for God, his word, and his church, as opposed to just bare obedience or, or intellectual assent. You can look for a sense of alienation from the world. We should be aliens here and ambassadors of Christ, citizens of heaven, as we've talked about before. There should be a sense in which you feel like, I don't belong here. This isn't the right place for me. 
It's filled with all kinds of ugliness and sin and filth. And, and that's not where I belong. So a couple of verses to meditate on. 1 John 2, 5 and 6. If anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. We've looked at that verse before. And John 15, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing that is of any value. Nothing of good in God's sight. And that's true. The minute we get outside of Christ, and of course we can never be really outside of Christ because no one can snatch us out of his hand, but the minute we step out of walking with Christ and consciously being in that relationship, you know, we're going to mess things up. It's in Christ that we can do what is right and good and proper. And to prepare for next time, you should read chapter 9, which is, oh, I forgot to change this. You should read chapter 10, which is on glorification. And that will finish our study of redemption accomplished and applied. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do stand amazed at this doctrine of union with Christ. Lord, that you as the eternal, almighty, infinite, triune God with life in yourself should consider us your treasured possession, that you should pour your love out upon us and send your own son to die, that you should adopt us as your children, that you should call us into fellowship with you, that you should spend eternity with us in your presence. Lord, these are truths that we cannot begin to grasp or understand, but we praise you and we thank you and we ask your blessing on this day in Jesus' most holy name. Amen.